The modern paradigm would have you believe that red hair, blonde hair, blue eyes, green eyes, and rhesus negative blood are mutations that arose out of nowhere, kind of how they claim that this world and universe arose out of nowhere, simply by chance. However, they fail to explain why it originates in the same locations where there are stories of the gods coming down from the heavens to establish royal demigod lineages that would one day rule the earth. Also, why all legitimate royal families have rhesus negative blood, most of them also carrying R1BY DNA, which is from the Israelites who were created in the likeness of God. In this video, I will explain how the rhesus negative bloodline is the purest representation of what the ancient Israelites would have been. I'll also go into how the R1B haplogroup is the main body of Israelites, and this is provable through not only prophecy, history, and genetics, but also through heraldry, which was given to them for the purpose that they may be identified in the end times. So, what is this rhesus negative blood? Rhesus negative blood is often called alien blood by scientists because it lacks the rhesus monkey blood antigen. 85% of the human population is RH positive, with only 15% being RH negative. And out of 612 primate species and subspecies recognized by the International Union for Conservation of Nature, not one of them has rhesus negative blood. Anthropologist and historian Robert Sepper has been bringing to light the fact that Cro-Magnon carried rhesus negative blood and for the last 30,000 years have remained nearly unchanged. A Cro-Magnon DNA sequence 28,000 years old was obtained from fossil bones discovered in the Paglici cave in Italy. Results show that the DNA is identical to the DNA sequences of modern Europeans. The DNA sequence has remained static and unchanged for 28,000 years. This means that Cro-Magnon was a fully modern individual who perhaps had a larger brain capacity. Re-examining the out-of-Africa theory and the origin of Europeans in light of the genealogy, 7,556 haplotypes of 46 subclades and 17 major haplogroups were considered, and the finding that the European haplogroups did not send from African haplogroups A or B is supported in the fact that bearers of the European haplogroups, as well as all non-African haplogroups, did not carry these SNPs. So besides the fact that this blood type seems to be alien in nature, what are some traits of rhesus-negative blooded people? They usually have ESP, psychic abilities, having a feeling of just knowing that something is going to happen before it does. Higher than average IQ, a drive to seek out truth or answers, love of nature and outdoors, a feeling of not belonging or being an outsider, a love and interest for space and science, frequent empathetic illnesses, tendency toward healing professions, Tendency to be in close proximity to unexplicable strange events. For example, UFO sightings. And in my case, I've seen two. Once as a child and then once as an adult when I was off 6.5 grams of mushrooms. And now we get to the physical traits. They often have a larger than average head size. And I'm going to get into that later. Heightened senses including vision. Stronger than average immune systems. Lower than average body temperature, blood pressure, and a low pulse rate. An extra river vertebrae, which some people compare to the Adam and Eve story. They also have extremely high rates of left-handedness, and it's speculated that left-handedness actually comes from the rhesus-negative bloodline. And as you know, Hebrew is written right to left. Could it be because it's written by left-handed rhesus-negatives? More traits of this bloodline is reddish or blonde hair and green or blue eyes that change and are piercing. You should know that geneticists compared mitochondrial DNA from blue-eyed individuals in countries as diverse as Jordan, Denmark, and Turkey, concluding that people with blue eyes have a single common ancestor that lived near the Black Sea area 8,000 years ago, spreading out with agriculture. The first blue-eyed humans were among the Proto-Indo-European Aryans who subsequently spread agriculture into Western Europe and later rode horses into Iran and India. As you can see here, there are still traces of this lineage in Afghanistan, Iran, Pakistan, and India. Many studies are now coming out explaining how anomalous blue-eyed people came to Israel 6,500 years ago. This data was extrapolated by a study of bones from a massive Galilee necropolis 
helping fill a 3,000 year gap in knowledge of ancient Levin settlers. And as you know, Jesus was from Galilee, but we'll get into that later. This should be no surprise, as ancient art from Egypt, Samaria, and Israel all depict blue-eyed people. It's important to note that Abraham, the ancestor of the Israelites, actually came from Mesopotamia, and we'll get into the migrations in a bit, but I want you to understand that Abraham was blessed because he kept his bloodline pure and intact and retained his belief in God. I'm going to play a short clip from a channel called Relics of Truth, which portrays what I'm trying to tell you. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him, saying, I am God Almighty. Live in my presence and be blameless. I will set up my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell face down, and God spoke with him. As for me, here is my covenant with you. You will become the father of many nations. Your name will no longer be Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I will make you the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful and will make nations and kings come from you. I will confirm my covenant that is between me and you and your future offspring throughout their generations. It is a permanent covenant to be your God and the God of your offspring after you. The entire meaning of this video is that he kept his rhesus negative bloodline intact. And if you're skeptical, let me draw comparisons. You have the Israelites claimed to be the seed of God who write right to left and obtain all their blessings through their bloodline from Abraham who makes a covenant with God but has to keep his bloodline pure in order to maintain the blessings. He promised his descendants will fill the earth and establish many king lines. Then you have this extremely rare blood type that comes with tons of extra conscious abilities and extremely rare phenotypes, high IQ, many have seen UFOs, and every single royal family on earth carries this blood type. Not to mention, tons of them are left handed. All royal families are rhesus negative blooded and R1B haplogroup. All presidents descend from Scottish and English royalty, 5 out of the last 7 were left handed. Now people will claim that this line is from the Nephilim. However, they fail to understand that most Nephilim had died out, and the ones who remained cannot reproduce with humans, as they were supposedly giants. It's physically impossible. I should also mention that the Nephilim are made in the likeness of the fallen angels, and the fallen angels were made in the likeness of God, who they were under the control of. That means that even the Nephilim would carry the RH negative blood from God. Therefore, the Adamic line, who is also made in the likeness of Yahweh, would also carry rhesus negative blood. That being said, the Israelites were tall, and one little proof is that the end time servant, who has been identified as the third Elijah type, is said to be so tall he cannot fit in other people's beds. So in modern times, he must be around 6'2 at least. Now the Nephilim accusations aren't the only thing we have against us. Let me introduce you to the black Hebrew Israelites. Back in depth to all you crackers, man. That's right. Oh, punks, man. That's right. I want to back your fucking head, man. That's right. Oh, they're the young. They're the young. I want to take these babies and hell, you got fucking hate you, devil. That's in. Yeah, get out of here, man. We we ain't none of them guys, all right. You ain't about to come up here and call us. I'm no sorry. Spectacle. Call the cops. Call the cops. Did any of you see him just physically assaulted? Call the cops. Don't be nice to me. Fuck that is here, uncalled for. Get the fuck up. Get the fuck out of here. Get the That's right. Why did you say that? Why did you say that you wouldn't kick my ass? You can't kick my ass. If you kick me, you kick yourself. 
African. No, but I'm not African. 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 Good for you. Let me ask you a question. Good for you. Let me ask you. They from Israel. They from Israel. I was born in Africa, raised in Israel. We are not African. We two separate people. The Africans are a disgusting people, man. I need to put a picture of how disgusting African culture is so my people would separate from Africans. My people are not African. My people are the Negroes. So what happens when one of y'all feels so overwhelmed by the spirit of God that when you see one of each other's daughters, you just grab her up? You gonna tell one of these brothers here? Come on, you know the doctrine. You know how it get when you get. Well, well, answer, 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 answer. We just, we just told you that. that but if it did happen, hold on. But if it did happen, but if it did happen, you would let allow it to happen. Why? Yeah. Because you go back to the scriptures. You're supposed to be a brother. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. You gonna allow one of your brothers to rape Wait. your daughter? Look, Look, man. When the kingdom is established, we are gonna get women when they 12 years old. Right. All right. Say it again. Question. Have sex with them. Have babies, man. No. With 12 year olds, brother, there's this in the kingdom. We're going to do that, man. We're going to get them young. <laughs> the black Hebrew Israelites claim that all white people are descendants of Esau and white skin is a product of albinism coming from the African American Israelites. They failed to explain how white people actually have more phenotypes than them, considering they would be albino. For example, red hair, blonde hair, brown hair, black hair green eyes, blue eyes, brown eyes, hazel eyes, etc. Not to mention, Esau came out red-haired. Now with this, they usually claim that all red-haired people come from Esau. However, this trait has to come from somewhere up the ladder, possibly from Noah, who is said to be made in the likeness of God. And as you know, red hair is a trait of rhesus negative blood, which is said to be alien blood. Regardless of how Esau's descendants would look, Jacob would have also carried this trait and passed it on to the Israelites. This is just one example of the contradictory nature of this black Hebrew Israelite movement. On one hand, they're claiming that Esau is albino and that white people are albino. And then on the other hand, they're claiming that Esau is the red-haired man. Doesn't make sense. If you think about it, Esau's grandfather, Jacob's grandfather, is the same man, Abraham, and he met God and was told that he would have a bloodline that would rule the earth. And the people in charge of ruling the earth right now are all of rhesus negative blood, many of them carrying the red hair trait. And did I mention that they all carry the R1B haplogroup, which originates in Asia and comes through Mesopotamia. Now, if you don't believe me that white people could have lived in Asia and came through the Middle East and settled in the Levant, let me go into some biblical descriptions of some Israelites. So not only was Esau red-haired and therefore white, but Jesus is also a very misinterpreted figure. The first thing I want to get into is the misconception that Jesus would have been black because he blended in with the Egyptians. By the time of Jesus, there had already been a Roman invasion, a Ptolemaic era, and a Hyksos era, meaning the entire delta would have been Caucasian. Now, another misconception. They claim Jesus had a big white afro because the Bible says he had hair white like wool. This is a misconception because it never says he has hair like wool. It just says white like wool because white isn't a common color in nature. Furthermore, it says he has eyes like a flame of fire. You can take this symbolically, or you can take it literally. And if you take it literally, what is the only color in a fire that is present in eyes? It's blue, and blue is also the hottest part of the flame. Essentially, Jesus has intense eyes flaming like fire. This should make sense after I just explained that there was a massive influx of blue-eyed settlers 6,500 years ago. Furthermore, it says Jesus had arms and feet like the brass of Lebanon. This is from the Aramaic Bible, and Jesus himself spoke Aramaic. The brass of Lebanon looks more like gold than typical bronze, which is what the modern mistranslations say. This has misled many people into believing that Jesus had dark skin. Further proof of this is that they wore sandals and did not have long sleeves. So Jesus' arms and feet were like the brass of Lebanon, even though they were exposed to the sun, meaning he would have been white. 
People also think that King Solomon was black because of a misinterpreted quote. See, in Song 510, his lover says, My lover is white and ruddy. Most people claim that ruddy means reddish black skin, but here she clearly says white and ruddy, and ruddy is known to mean to blush or show red in the face. Where the misconceptions come in is when Solomon says, I am black but comely. Now one, if he was black and the rest of them were black, why would he have to pronounce his race? Furthermore, if black was seen as beautiful and comely, why would he have to say, I am black but comely? Obviously, it wasn't common to those people. This is further backed up by the next verse where he says, I am black because the sun hath touched me. I have worked in the field all day. So there you have it. He was white and ruddy and then turned black, but still beautiful after being in the sun. This is the same type of misconception and deception being projected onto the Queen Tia or Queen Tai debate. Queen Tai is the grandmother of Tutankhamun, who was the son of Akhenaten, the first king to usher in monotheism under the worship of the sun. People claim that Queen Tia was black because they draw their conclusions off the unpainted, darkened yew wood bust of her. People should know that yew wood, when it is fresh and not wet, looks like white skin. However, after thousands of years, it darkens. They also mistake her snakeskin headdress as an afro, and entirely ignore the traces of blue paint. They never look at her mummy, which has natural, straight, wavy, reddish hair. She also has a Caucasian-looking face. They also haven't looked at her parents, Yuya and Tuyu. The race of this people is corroborated by King Tutankhamun, who bears the R1BY DNA. Hence Rauder's title, half of European men share King Tutankhamun's DNA. The results show that King Tut belonged to a genetic profile group known as haplogroup R1B1A2, to which more than 50% of men in Western Europe belong, indicating that they share a common ancestor. We think the common ancestor lived in the Caucasus about 9,500 years ago. Up to 70% of British men and half of all Western European men are related to the Egyptian pharaoh Tutankhamun. Among modern-day Egyptians, this haplogroup contingent is below 1%. Around 70% of Spanish men and 60% of French men also belong to this genetic group. The Hyksos were a group of foreign rulers from Phoenicia, and Phoenicia was a Semitic population. Many people claim that Moses is actually Akhenaten, the father of Tutankhamun, and as you know, Akhenaten was the first ruler to usher in monotheism under the sun. Regardless of whether this is true, they were genetically synonymous and must have carried the same Y-DNA profile, which comes directly from Noah through Shem. I should note that the countries with the highest amount of R1B Y-DNA are also the countries in which rhesus-negative blood is the most prolific. This haplogroup follows the migrational patterns of the Israelites exactly. But before I go into that, let's read a couple articles explaining the migrations of this haplogroup. In the Levant in Africa, like its northern counterpart, R1B M269, R1B V88 is associated with the domestication of cattle in northern Mesopotamia. Both branches of R1B probably split soon after the cattle were domesticated, approximately 10,500 years ago, around 8,500 BCE. R1B V88 migrated south towards the Levant in Egypt. The migration of R1B people can be followed archaeologically through the presence of domesticated cattle, which appear in central Syria around 8,000 to 7,500 BCE, then in the southern Levant and Egypt around 7,000 to 6,500 BC. Cattle herders subsequently spread across most of northern and eastern Africa. The Sahara Desert would have been more humid during the Neolithic subpluvial period and would have been a vast savanna full of grass, an ideal environment for cattle herding. Evidence of cow herding during the Neolithic era has shown up at Wan Muhagiag in central Libya around 5000 BCE, at the Capaletti Cave in northern Algeria, around 4500 BCE. But the most compelling evidence that R1B people related to modern Europeans once roamed the Sahara is to be found at Tassili Najer in southern Algeria, 
famous site of pyroglyphs dating from the Neolithic era. Some paintings dating from around 3000 BCE depict fair skinned and blonder auburn haired women riding on cows. The oldest known R1B V88 sample in Europe is a 6,200 year old farmer slash herder from Catalonia tested by Hak et al. in 2015. Autosomally, this individual was a typical Near Eastern farmer, possessing just a little bit of Mesolithic West European admixture. Nowadays, small percentages, around 1-4% to of R1B V88 are found in the Levant, among the Lebanese, the Druze, and the Jews, and almost in every country in Africa north of the equator. Higher frequency in Egypt, 5%, among Berbers from the Egypt-Libya border, 23%, among the Sudanese Copts, 15%, the Hausa people of Sudan, 40%, the Fulani people of the Sahel, 54%, the Chadic tribes of northern Nigeria and northern Cameroon, around 30 to 95%. According to Cruciani et al., 2010, R1B V88 would have crossed the Sahara around 9,200 and 5,600 years ago and is most probably associated with the diffusion of Chadic languages, a branch of the Afroasiatic languages. V88 would have migrated from Egypt to Sudan, then expanded along the Sahel until northern Cameroon and Nigeria. However, R1B V88 is not only present among Chadic speakers, but also among Senegambian speakers and Semitic speakers. Horses were first domesticated around 4600 BC in the Caspian Steppe, perhaps somewhere around the Don or the Lower Volga, and soon became a defining element of steppe culture. Nevertheless, it is unlikely that R1B was already present in the eastern steppes at the time, so the domestication of the horse should be attributed to the indigenous R1A people, or the tribes belonging to the older R1B P297 branch, which settled in eastern Europe during the late Paleolithic or Mesolithic period. Samples from Mesolithic Samara and Latvia all belong to the R1B P297. Autosomally, these Mesolithic R1A and R1B individuals were nearly pure Mesolithic East European, sometimes with a bit of Siberian admixture, but lacked the additional Caucasian admixture found in Chalcolithic, Afensevo, Yamna, and Corded Ware samples. Another migration across the Caucasus happened shortly before 3700 BC, when the Mayakop culture, the world's first Bronze Age society, suddenly materialized in the Northwest Caucasus, apparently out of nowhere. The origins of Mayakop are still uncertain, but archaeologists have linked it to contemporary Chalcolithic cultures in Assyria and Western Iran. Archaeology also shows a clear diffusion of bronze working in the Kurgan-type burials from the Mayakop culture to the Pontic Steppe, where the Yamna culture developed soon afterwards. Kurgan burials would become a dominant feature of ancient Indo-European societies and were widely used by the Celts, Romans, Germanic tribes, Scythians, and among others. This is another article on the R1A haplogroup in Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and Southern India. Haplogroup R1A descended from the same common ancestor as R1B, but traveled and made home in a very different area of the world since branching. Its most widely found subbranch, called RM417 today, centers in Eastern Europe and also in Central Asia and Southern India. R1B haplogroup in Western Europe R1B is the most numerous branch in Western Europe today, with as many as 3 out of 5 individuals being a member of its prolific subbranch RM269. Another well-recognized hotspot is also found east of the Baltic Sea, and then scattered low frequency in other far-flung areas in Asia and Africa. Descendants of that original haplogroup R ancestor migrated and accrued additional mutations that formed the major sub-branches we see today, R1A and R1B. From regions around the Caspian Sea, descendants of R1A moved west through Central Europe and into Scandinavia. R1B took a distinctively more western and southerly route that made its way to Western Europe and out to the British Isles. Haplogroup R2 also exists and initially migrated into South Asia. Today, R2 descendants are found at the highest levels among the Barusho people of Pakistan. 
in India, it is speculated that the Brahmin caste was actually descended from the R1A haplogroup, which would explain their Indo-European slash Aryan roots. Now, if you look at the R1B haplogroup today, they exactly match the migrational patterns of the Israelites. You can see that they traveled down the Nile into Ethiopia and then westwards through the rivers that connect into Lake Chad. Not only that, they traveled northwards through Scythia, becoming the Germanic tribes, and moved westwards and northwards. Essentially, this haplogroup is everywhere and is responsible for many innovations and massive paradigm shifts. Before I move on to the next part, I want to bring up Judah's prophecy, and I want you to understand that either I am right or God is a liar and never kept his promise. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. In Europe, all royal families have been of the R1B haplogroup, some examples include the royal house of Mount Baden Windsor, all kings of Denmark from Christian I to Frederick IX, the royal house of Stuart, the royal house of Saxe Coburg Gotha, all Romanov Tsars of Russia from Paul I to Nicholas II. Here you can see the house of Wedden, haplogroup R1B U106, who is the kings of the Belgians from 1831 to the present. The kings of the United Kingdom from 1901 to 1952, the kings of Bulgaria from 1887 to 1946, the kings of Portugal 1853 to 1910, the kings of Poland 1709 to 1763, and the kings of Saxony 1806 to 1918. The Royal House of Bourbon, haplogroup R1B U106, who were the kings of France 1589 to 1791 and 1814 to 1830, the kings of Spain from 1700 to 1808, 1813 to 1868, 1874 to 1931, and 1975 to the present, the kings of Sicily from 1815 to 1861, and the Grand Dukes of Luxembourg 1964 to the present. That being said, it's not exclusive to royalty. One example is Che Guevara, that being said, one of the highest concentrations of R1B haplogroup, as well as rhesus negative blood, is in the British Isles. It should be noted that in Hebrew, Ish means man and Brit means covenant, and Ish Brit means man of the covenant. So therefore, British would mean covenant men, and Britain, covenant land. And no, Britain is not just England, it is England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Their collective flag is called the Union Jack, a.k.a. the Union Jacob, who was renamed Israel. Therefore, it is the Union of Israel. The colors are red, white, and blue, similar to the Egyptian crowns. And as I said earlier, the Egyptian rulers in the Hyksos dynasty were all of the R1B haplogroup. Another land established by the UK, also symbolized by the red, white, and blue, has been linked with the R1B haplogroup and most people are completely unaware. I want you to be aware that there are 14 haplogroups. 12 out of 20 of the founding fathers had R1B haplogroup, many of them being the most important figures such as George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, Samuel Adams, John Rutledge, Edward Rutledge, Roger Sherman, Peyton Randolph, Edmund Randolph, Patrick Henry, John Witherspoon, 
and John Hancock. And then you go to the American Civil War, where Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses S. Grant, George McClellan, William Sherman, Winfield Hancock, all R1B Haplogroup, Jefferson Davies, Braxton Bragg, J.E.B. Stewart, and Nathan B. Forrest are all R1B Haplogroup meaning almost all of the prolific leaders throughout the Civil War were all of the R1B haplogroup, not to mention they were both signified by the red, white, and blue. Now I will get into the Israelite symbolism and heraldry present in all of these nations, but first it is important to understand that Ephraim's symbol is a unicorn and Judah's is the lion. Scotland's national animal is the unicorn, and in Scotland you can see a large percentage of their clans have R1B lineage. These clans are Clan MacDonald, Clan Home, Clan Gordon, Clan Boyd, Clan Armstrong, Clan Grant, Clan Erskine, Clan St. Clair, Clan Cochrane, Clan MacDougall, Clan Bruce, Clan Sutherland, Clan McLean, Clan Mackenzie, Clan Campbell, Clan McPherson, Clan Buchanan, Clan McGregor, Clan McBean, Clan McLaren, Clan Cameron, Clan Drummond, Clan Mary, and Clan Boyle. Anybody familiar with ancient history would know that prior to the throne being in England, it was in Scotland, and before that, in Ireland. This is prophesied in the Bible. The United Church of God in Canada asks, but couldn't the throne have been transferred elsewhere for a long time before being transferred in the British Isles? The indirect answer from prophecy seems to be no. In Ezekiel 21, 26-27, God declared that Zedekiah was to remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. A change or transfer was occurring, exalting him that is low, and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, meaning the crown, that is, the throne. And it shall be no more overturned until he who comes whose right it is, and I will give it to him. Notice that the final overturned was added in brackets for the sake of clarity. Some see this verse as a prophecy of the overthrow of the crown, that it would be no more, meaning no longer exist until Christ came to claim it. Yet this cannot be the meaning of this prophecy, or God would be breaking his unbreakable promise of David and an unbreakable dynasty. So the overturning must refer to the removing of the throne from one nation and the rising it up in another. And the mentioning of overturn three times would certainly seem to be saying that such overturning would occur three times. That three times the throne would be transferred to another nation, and that it would be transferred again and that it wouldn't be transferred again until Jesus Christ's coming in power and glory to take it over. This is why the symbols of Judah and the descendants of Judah are found in each of the isles. Not to mention, the fact that this is such a small location means that the intermixing would be extremely high and everybody would carry this ancestry to a certain degree. Here is a quick clip from Truthvids regarding the heraldry of Judah all throughout Europe and primarily in the UK. Next up, Judah. He had but one primary symbol and that was the lion. However, there's more to it as there were two separate tribes of Judah. So you have the blood red lion or sometimes instead the blood red hand and alternatively King David's harp, the first Judah king. So the lion symbol again was from the eastern camps which Judah was the head of. Now Judah had twin sons Zerah and Pharaoh. Zerah inherited the greater birthright because his hand came out first and it was covered in blood so that became the symbol the blood red hand or blood red lion. Pharez had the second birthright and amongst his descendants was King David and that's where we get the harp which was his personal symbol when he played it for King Saul. 
The lion symbol is everywhere in the monarchies, the harp mostly in Ireland, it's interesting that the British monarchy has both the red lion and David's harp, showing that they have both bloodlines, Zera and King David's. The blood hand is a bit rarer, we especially see it in Irish and Scottish heraldry. Again, red lion, we do see it here and there throughout Europe. For prophecies, virtually every king in Europe uses that lion symbol, and every kingdom or Always has. Is this not the kings of Judah ruling over the children of Israel or Europeans? Even the ruling scepter of Judah is typically used by the monarchies, and even in the heraldry you often see that, like an eagle holding a scepter. The coronation ceremony of Queen Elizabeth is exactly the same as King David's, it's still there. Even the stone of destiny, or Jacob's pillar, the one our main ancestor slept on, that the kings of Judah were to be coronated on has passed on as well all the way through to Ireland, to Scotland, and to England. So there you have it. The kings of Judah are still ruling, and their cousins are found all throughout the islands that they rule over. More prophecy coming true is that Psalms 67 says, Gilead is mine, and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is my helmet. Judah is my scepter. Notice how Ephraim is on the top of the island and the royal lineage is now situated in England. Biblical prophecy come true. Here's a short clip from Robert Sepper regarding the symbolism behind the unicorn. That said, constellations play a pivotal role in astrotheology and today I'd like to focus on the role of the unicorn. Monoceros is Latin for unicorn and is the name of the constellation of the unicorn, only visible in the winter months in the northern sky. Then it disappears from view, reappearing again the following winter, and so appears to die, but then is reborn again the following winter, December 25th, which also coincides with the winter solstice, where the sun is reborn. As a result of fathers and mothers' interest in uh, medieval uh, art and architecture, when they heard from a dealer in France whom they'd known and through whom, whom they'd bought a certain number of things of the availability of a remarkable set of Gothic tapestries called the Unicorn Tapestries. I think this was back in the 20s. They were delighted to be able to buy them. This was certainly one of the most wonderful acquisitions that my parents were ever able to acquire. While my parents rarely talked about the symbolism in the tapestries, they did tell me the story of the hunt of the unicorn. The unicorn, they explained, is the symbol of Christ, and the resurrection is represented in the last tapestries, where the unicorn has revived after having been killed by hunters. This is why the end-time servant slash prophet, who Nick James Vanderland identified as the third Elijah type, will be broadcasting a message to Ephraim, and also have paternal descent from them. The unicorn symbolizes the resurrection of Jesus, and Elijah is the catalyst for the second coming. Now you can say they stole this heraldry, but in the Bible each camp is attributed their own standard for the sole purpose that they may be able to identify themselves in the end times. And the prophecies that match the symbols were clues to the identity of the tribes. The end time servant is the one who will bring light to this. The Bible never says the white man who is evil will steal all the heraldry, fulfill the prophecy, and then hide the true lineage of the Israelites. It never says the albino Esau descendant is going to rule over the earth. It does, however, say the 13th tribe of Israel, the tribe of Dan, will be a serpent upon the road and a dragon upon the path to injure a horse in its foot and throw its rider on its back. However, that is for later. Now I wanted to say quick, the Bible is full of microcosms and macrocosms, as above so below. So what is happening on an astrological, astronomical, and conscious level is being mirrored by our avatars here on Earth. The planets and constellations are conscious filters that your brain picks up on, hence why there are processions, eras, and zodiacs that affect your personality. This is true whether you would like to believe it or not. Therefore, Jesus could represent the sun, while also being a real man who draws his consciousness from the light that is within us all. Jesus teaches many times that what is in him is also in you, and those who believe him will do many miracles. This is a topic for another video though. 
linking back to the rhesus negative bloodline, your blood greatly affects your personality type. Your personality is intertwined with the zodiacs, the stars, and your blood type, and your genetics. Many rhesus negative blooded people account for the majority of the demographic of rare personality types. For example, I am INFJ, which accounts for less than 1% of the human population. Guess who else is INFJ? Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. Note that both of them have Lion of Judah heraldry. Not only that, Malcolm X had red hair, and he was also Scottish. Remember the Bible verse. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all people on earth will be blessed through you. Everywhere the R1B haplogroup goes, Israelite symbolism is prominent, and people seem to be blessed. So I'm going to show which nations contain which tribes, and how to apply that same detective work on finding Israelite ancestry in your own family. Like I said, the haplogroup is prominent in the United Kingdom, so let's look there first. So first let's look at the collective coat of arms. In the middle you have three lions, which came from the Normans, who were the tribe of Dan mixed with Reuben mixed with Judah. Then you have Scotland's royal banner, which is the lion rampant, and surrounded by the mandrake lily flower. The bottom left you have the harp of David, which is the Ferez line. On the right you have the unicorn, which is Ephraim, who has a chain of bondage turned to a crown. And on the left you have another lion rampant. On the top, the lions holding the scepter. In Ireland, you have, at the bottom left, the hand of Ulster, which I'll explain later is the hand of Zerah. You have on the right, the harp of David, which is Ferez, so there you have the unification of the Judah line. On the top left, you have the three crowns, which is Judah, Ferez, and Dan. And proof of it being Dan is on the right side, where you have the eagle, which represented Dan, and then the sword, which represents Simeon. Now, like I said, the hand of Northern Ireland is actually the hand of Zorah. The history behind it goes, Ferez and Zorah were twins. At first, Zorah was actually the one to come out, because his hand popped out. It was covered in blood, and they wrapped a red thread around his wrist in order to identify the firstborn. However, he popped back in, and Ferez then came out. Therefore, Ferez got the bloodline, and Zarah decided to actually leave. This article states, What else does scepter mean? Judah led in the conquest of Canaan, and received the first and choicest portion. David raised it to prominence over the tribes and the nations. He is the first king of the Judah Ferez line, and he did not appear for 700 years. Was there and is there an older line of royalty? The answer is yes. The Judah Zorah line was royal from the beginning. The two royalties are now merged and have been for centuries in the British royal house. And how long shall we have royalty? Until Shiloh comes. Shiloh came to Bethlehem, the first advent and will come again at the end of time. Royalty is eternal. The throne of David is everlasting. All the remaining royalty in Europe descends from Judah. And the Judah Zerah royalty is, I repeat, 700 years older than the Judah Ferez line because it began at once. You can read Genesis 38 to see how royalty began, but there is much more to talk about. Zerah's son Ethan was very wise. And indeed, this line of Judah Zerah was the only line termed wise. On the other hand, he led his people north, from Egypt, where he was born, into what is now the Asia Minor. And his son Mahol continued likewise. Mahol's heir, Darda, reached the western shore, where on a commanding site he founded the metropolis of Troy. The date is 1520 BC. Here the city flourished for nearly 400 years. Darda saw the straits that separated Europe and Asia and gave them his name, Dardanelles. Darda founded a fort here that is named after him. But the greatest honor is recorded in the Bible. Solomon was wiser than all men, than Darda, the son of Mahol. 
Thus great was the founder of Troy and the sire of the Trojan race, whose children abide with us still. Troy fell because her sons had an eye for the refined beauty in women. Her descendants still have that exquisite eye and are naturally very proud and accomplished. When Troy fell, she did so to arise on another shore in eternal and imperial splendor. I am not referring to Italy. That empire, though long, was ephemeral, and Italy is only an interlude. Aeneas, a member of the old royal family, attained the kingship and led the Sidon Trojans around the Mediterranean Sea, as graphically described in the Aeneid, and finally brought them to their new home on the river Tiber in Italy. Including this Italian interlude, the Trojan period embraced 417 years. Here on the river Tiber happened a very sad event. Too sad to be recalled, and would not be for its denouement. Brutus was at one day hunting with his father Silvius, when he spied the prey, as he thought, and let an arrow fly. On running up, he was shocked and grieved to find out he had killed his own father. Some people then, as now, were censorious, and Brutus departed from the new colony, which later sprang Rome. From there, he and his followers sailed through the Mediterranean, through the Pillars of Hercules, and northwards, along the East Atlantic Main, across the English Channel to the present River Dart, and up its stream to Totnes, where, stepping on a large stone, he landed on the great island which was ever to bear his name as a memorial among the proud nations of the world. This rock more famous throughout the centuries than Plymouth Rock, is marked as Brutus Rock, and has been visited perennially by people of all nations, ranks, and ages. With his people, he explored the whole island, and he apportioned to each one according to his rank and services. At last, he decided the proper place for his capital, a choice bank on the Thames River, so named for a stream, Diamis, in Epirus, from which he first sailed, and there he built his metropolis, and according to the advice of the oracle, he named it Tri Novantum, New Troy. This name it bore for over 1100 years until King Lud, at the beginning of the Christian era, built her walls and renamed her Ludden. Lud's wall easily refined into London. London is also derived by some from Landon, meaning sacred eminence. London dates from 350 years before Rome. Why should Rome be called the Eternal City? This might dumbfound you that it should be the history of Zerah Judah. As for Ferez Judah, they mostly went into the Assyrian captivity to join them with the ten northern tribes. You might ask, well, if this is all true, why hasn't my pastor mentioned this? The answer to such a question can be found in Isaiah 29, 10-13, which says, For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, he seers hath he covered. And the vision of all is become unto you as the worlds of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. And the book is delivered to him that it is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I am not learned. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by this precept of man. Now if you don't believe that this has Zorah Judah lineage, also consider the fact that there is a Jewish star or seal of Solomon behind the red hand, and on top has the crown, which is symbolic of the crown of Judah. Then we go to Wales, where the dragon is depicted. The dragon represents Scythians, who were actually captive Israelites dispersed northwards by the Assyrians. When these tribes dispersed northwards, they actually intermixed with Aryan tribes, therefore replacing the Adamic nations like they were prophesied to. I should note that long before that, the house of Dinifer in Wales was even depicting the lion rampant. I actually descend from them through Raymond Fitzgerald Lagrasse, Therefore also descend from Rodri the Great and Rhys ap Tudor, who is the ancestor of the Tudor dynasty. The Tudor dynasty is represented by the Tudor Rose. Yair Davidi from Israel claims, The Zohar describes the people of Israel as like a rose with red and white petals and five green leaves. This description fits the Tudor Rose, which became the symbol of England and all of the British monarchy. 
you can also see that the Tudor rose is identical to the crown anemone, which is Israel's national flower. The crown anemone opens with the sun and tracks the Son of God throughout the day, because it's all about the Son of God. More proof that these people descend from the Scythians is that Scotland, up north, in the 1320 Declaration of Our Broth, claim that they descend from Greater Scythia. I'm going to play a short clip explaining this migration and the Declaration. Now, no one's telling the story as to what happened to the 12 tribes. James 1.1 1, 1 in the greatest story book, the Bible, talks about the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. The 12 tribes are those that descended from Abraham. In the book of Genesis, chapter 17, we are told that God made a covenant with Abraham, saying that his seed would form a multitude of nations. Now, his seed was to come through a son named Isaac. The term Isaac's sons and Saxons are very similar, and many think that's the connection. But no one seems to think, who are those nations today? What happened to those nations? Briefly, we can tell you, they formed a nation under the King David and King Solomon, his son. And then after Solomon died, his son Rehoboam took the throne. They divided into two nations. The ten northern tribes were called the nation or house of Israel. The two southern tribes were called the house of Judah. And in about 700 A.D., the Assyrians attacked and uprooted the ten northern tribes and replanted them, so to speak. They moved them to the further parts of the Assyrian border. But what happened after that, that being around 700 A.D.? What happened to those people? Is it true that they migrated over the Caucasus mountain range, settled into the regions of Europe, and that's where we get the term Caucasian? Well, it appears from the evidence that it is. There are several places to get that evidence, but one place is an interesting place. It's an ancient document going back to the year 1320, the Scottish Declaration of Independence. In 1320, in order to remain free from the English control, some 25 Scottish nobles and King Robert the Bruce of Scotland drew up a petition which still today can be viewed at the Register House in Edinburgh. It was drawn up by one Bernard D. Linton, who was abbot of Aberbothick and chancellor of Scotland. And it has been described by the Scots as, quote, probably our most precious possession, end quote. It's known as the Declaration of Independence for the Scots, and in it is proof that the Scots were part of those tribes. We have printed that portion of the Scottish Declaration, and we read it to you now. We know, Most Holy Father and Lord, and from the chronicles and books of the ancients, gather that among other illustrious nations, ours to wit, the nation of the Scots, has been distinguished by many honors, which passing from the greater Scythia through the Mediterranean Sea and pillars of Hercules, and sojourning in Spain among the most savage tribes through a long course of time, could nowhere be subjugated by any people, however barbarous. And coming thence 1,200 years after the outgoing of the people of Israel, they by many victories and infinite toil acquired for themselves the possession of the West, which they now hold. In their kingdom, 113 kings of their own royal stock, no stranger intervening, have reigned. End of quote. Notice they said in this declaration about the outgoing of the people of Israel. In other words, they are some of those Israelite people. It's quite a story when you start looking into it. And we tell that story in a DVD called Roots, From Abraham to America. Now, besides the migrational patterns in history, is there any other proof that the Israelites end up in Scotland? Yes. The first being that the ancient Israelite clan system remains in Scotland unchanged. Each clan has a patriarch who is attributed a symbol and clan colors 
which have now become the Tardans. Not to mention, most of these tribes bear ancient Israelite symbolism, the most prominent being the Lion of Judah. There is also the Kilt and Bagpipe, which this video will explain, actually came out of the Middle East, then being brought to Greece by the Macedonians, who were likely of Manasseh and Dan. The Hebrew tribes of Manasseh and Dan joined forces and became the Macedonians, or Macedonians. They fled to Greece with their gold and their riches. They wore white kilts like the Egyptian pharaohs, played goatskin bagpipes, adopted the Greek culture, and settled along the river Danube, which they named after the tribe of Dan. So there you have it. Prior to the bagpipe being in Scotland, it was being used by descendants of the Israelites. Now this should be no surprise, as Macedonia also bared the lion rampant heraldry, also with a crown on top. I also want to bring up this ancient mosaic from the 3rd century, in which the Macedonians are depicted as red-headed, having hair like the lion. I should mention, it looks like they are actually fighting the lion, and this could be because they are from the tribe of Dan, which will contend with the other tribes, and be a serpent in the path biting the horses in the heel, causing his rider to fall back. Now, linking back to Ephraim, and the unicorn and the resurrection of Jesus, Scotland's royal banner has the red lion rampant, or the red lion of Judah, which represents Jesus' blood-covered body rising back up. That lion is surrounded by a bunch of mandrake slash lily flowers, which is the symbol for the tribe of Reuben. This symbol likely came in through the Normans, and this banner was instituted by Malcolm III, who was actually also my ancestor. And if you're from Scotland, he's most likely yours as well, making you a descendant of the Scottish kings and the Irish high kings. Before I move on to heraldry within other nations, I want to bring up the fact that the hand of Zara's meaning has been distorted and lost due to the Viking invasions. The Vikings were the Danites who were prophesied to be a snake in the path, a dragon upon the road, biting the horse in his heel, causing the rider to fall backwards. For Dan, he probably has the most symbols out of all the tribes, those being the eagle, the snake, the scales, and the rider tumbling backwards. The eagle was the sign of the northern camp, so another one of the four primary symbols. The snake was Jacob's prophecy, the first half that Dan would leave a viper's trail wherever they went. The scales simply comes from the name Dan, which means to judge, but also the prophecy that he would judge our people. And the rider was again Jacob's prophecy, the second part that Dan would buy at the rider's hill, causing it to tumble backwards. So the eagle is the most prominent to have survived, and we can see it just about everywhere, like all the European shields such as Poland and Germany have it. Sometimes the eagle and snake would get combined into a hybrid animal, like the Wessex Weaven, which is an eagle with a serpent-like body. So for prophecies, the Viper's Trail was wherever Dan went, they would name the location after their patriarch Dan. And you can see that with many rivers, cities, all across Europe. Denmark literally means Dan's Mark or Frontier. Its people are called the Danes. In their ancient legends, their ancestor was called Dan. Now a lot of the Vikings were in fact Danes, and did they not cause a lot of Christian Europe to tumble backwards, at least initially? But this had the positive effect of forcing those to rally together under a Christian king, such as King Alfred, and putting all their faith in God. Lastly, the Nordic countries were last of the European nations to finally convert to Christianity, so I have awaited your salvation, I believe, is referring to this. So it should be evident that this tribe was present in Ireland, and upon arriving, they changed the meaning of the already multiple hundred-year-old symbol of the Hand of Zara, and gave it their own little twist. They claim two sons of the king were racing to shore, and whoever's hand would touch it first would be the new king. So one of them cut their hand off and threw it to the shore in order to win. I want to make it clear that the hand cut off is the right hand. Now who would cut off their dominant hand? This might be more clues to the fact that they were left-handed. Now we will get to family heraldry and how to trace your own lineal descent to the Israelites. But first, I want to get into other nations that bear the symbolism as well. 
Netherlands coat of arms is the Lion Rampant, or Lion of Judah. Spain's shows the Lion Rampant, or Lion of Judah, with the waters of Reuben and the castle of Simeon. In the middle, it has three lily flowers, or mandrakes, which represents the tribe of Reuben. This makes sense because Reuben and Simeon are primarily in Spain and France. Denmark's royal coat of arms has the primal man and the lion of Judah. It also has the three crowns representing Judah, Ferez, Judah Zerah, and Dan. Which makes sense because all of Scandinavia is Danite. Such as Sweden, Denmark. Not only that, they came up the Danube River and descend from Odan. And by the way, the spelling doesn't exactly matter because in Hebrew, they did not have vowels. So it could be I, A, or O. Norway's is the Lion Rampant, or Lion of Judah. Sweden's is the Lion of Judah. The Eagle of Dan, the Castle of Simeon, and the Unstable Waters of Reuben. Iceland has the Bull of Ephraim, the Eagle of Dan, and the dragon of the Scythians. France has three mandrake lily flowers, and Belgium has the lion rampant, and in one of their smaller flags, they also have the Danite eagle on top of the Simeon castle. Finland has the lion rampant with a crown. Poland's got the eagle of Dan, as does Russia. The Czech Republic has both the lion rampant and the eagle of Dan wearing a crown. Lithuania has a soldier, which is Gad, riding a horse, which could possibly also mean they are Danite. Romania has the eagle holding a cross and a sword and a scepter. It also has the Lion of Judah holding a sword on a castle, which is Simeon, uh, the Bull of Ephraim, the Tudor Rose, which is the crown anemone. It has the Eagle of Dan again, twice. And now let's get into Central Africa where the R1B haplogroup is prominent. And let's be very clear, as soon as you leave the area where this haplogroup is prominent, these symbols fade away, unless they were instituted by Ephraim or Manasseh. Nigeria carries the White Horse of Dan and the Eagle of Dan, not to mention the six Tudor Roses slash crown anemones on the ground. Chad has the Lion of Judah on the right and arguably the Waters of Reuben in the middle. Ethiopia has the lion holding the scepter, as well as the Star of David slash Seal of Solomon in the center. And now finally, for more proof that the tribe of Dan is the 13th tribe of Israel and it's being hidden, we go to the American coat of arms. Here you can see 13 stripes, 13 leaves, 13 berries, 13 arrows, and 13 stars. All symbolic of the 13th tribe, Dan. Keep in mind, all presidents descend from royalty through Edward III and John of Gaunt. And if you look into their history, they descend from multiple royal families, including the Danites. Me and Donald Trump are actually cousins through the McLeod clan, who descend from none other than Ragnar Lodbrok, who many claim isn't historically a real person, but they're full of shit. It's the same kind of argument they used to make for Niall of Nine Hostages before he got proven to be real. And matter of fact, my Y-DNA descends directly from him, as I am R1B RM222. Niall of the Nine Hostages was symbolized by the Red Hand of Zerah, two Lion of Judas, and three Star of Davids up top. But anyway, back to Donald Trump and our Danite presidents. The tribe of Dan intermix with the Canaanites and the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were the original master architects, aka Freemasons. They also built Solomon's Temple. In another video, I'll explain how the Phoenicians were already in Ireland prior to the Israelites' existence. The Phoenicians later reconnect with this land through the Danites, who then established the, both the York Rite and Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Now you should know that the Scottish Rite leads to the Shriners, and the Shriners are symbolized by Akhenaten, who carries the R1B haplogroup, as do they, and the founding fathers, and all the royal lineages, regardless of location. Quickly, the Levites actually died out with the purging and genocide being implemented by the Roman Empire, 
who was really just an extension of Babylon and the Assyrians. And they also hide all of this information and ancestry from us, and also hide the Anunnaki origins of many religions worldwide. The Levites' last stronghold was in the UK, primarily in Ireland and Scotland. So most people there also have Levitic descent. Let me be very clear, Italians aren't bad people. It is not Italians, it is the Vatican and the Roman Empire. Anyway though, after all of this, it should be clear that everywhere the R1B and rhesus negative blood goes, Israeli symbolism is prominent and they fulfill many prophecies. If you don't believe me, understand there is micro and macrocosms within the Bible, as above, so below. What is happening on an astronomical, astrological, conscious scale is happening here with our avatars on Earth. And the prophecies of the entire tribe are also fulfilled by the individuals within them. I want you to keep Genesis 49, 8 in mind. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be on the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. I personally only watch UFC, or boxing sometimes. So I'm going to go into a list of all the greatest combat athletes of all time. So in MMA, you have George St. Pierre, John Jones, Anderson Silva, Conor McGregor, even the first man to beat him, Nate Diaz. You have my cousins, deep down the line somewhere, the Gracie family, who were the most prominent family in MMA history and actually created Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Then you have two new groups on the rise, one being from Nigeria through Kamaru Usman, and Israel Adesanya. Like I showed before, Nigeria has the horse, which is Danite, and the eagle, which is Danite, plus the Tudor Rose. Then you go to Francis Ngannou, who's from Cameroon. Cameroon's coat of arms is the scales, which is also Danite. Then you go to Russia, where a bunch of Dagestanis are becoming very prominent. Their main guy is Khabib, whose nickname is the eagle. See, they're all Danite, and they're all contending with Judah for the throne. Now some boxers. You got Muhammad Ali, whose original name was Cassius Clay. Mike Tyson. Lennox Lewis. Jack Dempsey, who's one of Mike Tyson's inspirations. Canelo Alvarez. Tyson Fury doesn't have it. However, he's from the land of Zara, which is Northern Ireland. And the guy that he beat out also has it. That man is wilder. Then when you go to the greatest athletes of all time, the first four that pop up, Michael Jordan, Muhammad Ali, LeBron James, Michael Phelps, all Lion of Judah. Tom Brady has the hand of Zara pointing to the sun, and Zara actually means sunrise. You got Kobe Bryant, Cristiano Ronaldo, Sidney Crosby, and I'm sure I'm missing a bunch of others. You can use this same technique on your grandparents' names and then their parents and so on and so forth and find out who you are. This is how I found out all about this. My paternal line has the Lion of Judah with a red crown. His mother has three Lion of Judahs, or the three crowns, as well as the Danite Eagle on top, again confirming that one of the crowns is Dan. And I thought my mother was entirely Italian. Turns out her DNA is 50% Greek, also Spanish and Iranian and Cyprus. Her father has two wolves, which is Benjamin. His name is Mena, which means gift of God. This is a Sephardic and Basque name, which makes sense why I would carry rhesus negative blood, as the Basque are also very high in rhesus negative. Her mother's last name is De Chiano, which means the Chianos. The Chiano crest has the red lion of Judah holding the crown anemone. And like I said earlier, the crown anemone is Israel's national flower. It opens with the sun and tracks the son of God throughout the day. So there you have the red lion of Judah, which is Jesus' blood-covered body rising back up, holding the crown of Israel. Now like I said, the tribe of Dan was traveling in Greece extremely early on. Both of my mother's parents are from Chieti, Italy, 
which was actually originally Tiati, named after Achilles' mother. It is said that Achilles founded the city and it is one of the most ancient cities in Italy. This would explain the DNA from Greece all over Italy. Not only that though, I want you to look at the crest of Chieti which shows Achilles riding on the horse of Dan holding a Danish flag. Not only that, but Achilles had red hair and it's said that in ancient Greece it was admired because it represented honor and courage. So by now, it should be evident why red hair, blue eyes, green eyes, and rhesus negative blood are prominent in the UK. Each of the migrations to this land have been conducted by either Israelites or Phoenicians, and the Phoenicians were also Semitic through Shem. From the Tuatha de Danon, to the Milesians, to the Saxons, to the Normans, all have carried Israelite symbolism, R1B haplogroup, and therefore the Israelites have coalesced through waves of invasions and migrations in the UK. Now who doesn't carry R1BY DNA? Who doesn't carry ancient Israelite heraldry? Who doesn't have king lines that they were promised by Abraham? Who aren't feared or respected? That is the fake modern you know what. The Bible even explains, as Nick Vanderland points out, that in the end times there will be blood Canaanites posing as Levites and Kohanim. Ironically, Danny Danon fulfilled the prophecy which proves that the Israelites are not in the land of Israel yet. And most of the people who believe they're obtaining Abraham's blessings are actually obtaining lies passed down from their ancestors. Now I'm going to end the video there because I honestly don't even know if this will render. But in another video, I'm going to go into the fallen angels, the uh, Anunnaki, the elongated skulls, the ley lines, the megaliths, the Garden of Eden, the Flower of Life, the Indo-Europeans, and also the Freemasons. So thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.